Hello, everyone, and welcome to our very first teacher workshop of the summer. This year's series will include two virtual programs focused on hot topics in the economy and one in person workshop that will be held at the Kansas City office centered on exploring new perspectives in diversity, equity, and inclusion in the classroom. My name is Gigi Wolf, Senior Economic Education Specialist for the Kansas City Fed, and my colleagues and I are excited to kick off our summer series today with a hot topic that's consumed a good deal of news coverage and has had repercussions worldwide. The Russia-Ukraine conflict although physically almost 3,000 miles away, has had significant impact on the U.S. and our economy. Today, we're going to focus on those implications and more specifically, their effect on energy and agriculture, two economic sectors that touch us day to day. Our two speakers have delved into these issues and their impact on an international scale. And so they'll first share some of the data and their research, and then we'll plan plenty of time for an open dialogue and a chance to answer your questions. So before we get into our discussion, I'd like to share a couple housekeeping items and reminders. The session will be recorded today and available on our website following the event. We'll also share a copy of the presentation um, so that you can use it for the future. You'll receive access information via email, along with a certificate template that you can use for your records or for professional development credit. As I mentioned, we've allotted plenty of time for questions and discussion with today's experts. So please submit any questions that you or your students might have at any time through the Q&A panel. We'll monitor it throughout the session and address as many as we possibly can. If you happen to run into any technical issues or questions related to technology, please send those through the chat feature and someone from our team will do our very best to help. Lastly, I must share our disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed by today's speakers are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City or of the Federal Reserve System. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce today's expert speakers. First, we have Courtney Cowley. She is a senior economist in the Regional Affairs Department based out of our Oklahoma City branch. Courtney joined the bank in 2015 after completing her PhD in Agricultural Economics at Oklahoma State University. Before that, she earned a bachelor's degree in biosystems engineering from Oklahoma State and a master's degree in civil engineering from Colorado State University. Primarily, Courtney focuses her research on agricultural finance, commodity markets, farm management, and natural resource economics and policy. She also serves as a special advisor to one of the Federal Reserve Board governors on the agricultural economy. Courtney routinely writes for the 10th District Survey of Agricultural Credit Conditions and Agricultural Finance Updates, both of which you can get free access to from our website. She's also published in several professional journals and books, including the Economic Review where her most recent article focused on long-term pressures and prospects for the cattle industry in the U.S. And next, we have David Rajevich, a senior economics specialist out of our Denver branch. David holds a master's degree in mineral and energy economics from Colorado School of Mines and a bachelor's degree in finance and economics from the University of Illinois. Prior to joining the bank in 2017, David served as an officer in the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Commissioned Officer Corps, where he served as a deck watch officer in Alaska and database manager in Boulder. Before that, he worked in financial services as a stock analyst 
in real estate investment trusts. Currently, David's research focuses on climate change and economics related to energy, natural resources, and our region, more specifically, the Rocky Mountain West region that includes Colorado, Wyoming, and Northern New Mexico. David is responsible for briefing our president, Esther George, on regional economic conditions, as well as energy-related issues in preparation for her participation as a voting member of the Federal Open Market Committee. He has published in the Economic Bulletin, Economic Review, Research Working Papers, and his latest article in the Rocky Mountain Economist covers investments in renewable energy. So, as you can tell, we have quite the brain trust with us today. And so, with that, I'll now turn it over to David and Courtney to help shed some light on today's topic and to share some highlights from their research. David and Courtney. Thank you so much, Gigi. Just give me one second and I'll do my screen share for the presentation. So are you able to see the presentation, Gigi? Yes, it's coming through clearly. All right, thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, the thoughtful introduction. So um, as you mentioned, very timely topic, Russia invading Ukraine with significant commodity implications um, globally, domestically, and regionally. Um, and in, the, in our, our recent article, we covered both the energy and agricultural implications you know, internationally as well as domestically and uh, and regionally. So, um, some of the key themes when we think about this uh, this commodity shock and Russians' invasion of Ukraine in Eastern Europe uh, caused broad disruptions in commodity markets writ large. So, in our article and our research, we're focusing mostly on energy and agriculture, but there are implications for other non-obvious things like metal markets and you know potash, and we'll touch on those a little bit uh, throughout the presentation and during the Q and A. Um, so, Russia and Ukraine are important producers as well as exporters of major energy and agricultural products. And when we think about this shock, there was just large exposure both on the production and the export side, and that has implications um, you know, regionally and globally. Uh, prices of key commodities are likely to remain high through the end of the year with significant implications for consumer prices. So, following this, uh, this commodity shock or the supply shock, we saw higher prices, and we would expect that to at least persist throughout the end of the year. And then we'll touch a little bit on sort of the more local factors, you know, how this is affecting consumers or how this is affecting sort of regional economies. Um, although the U.S. is a big producer and exporter of, you know, key energy and agricultural commodities, we are limited in our capacity to relieve some of those short-term commodity disruptions. Um, and we can expect that these disruptions associated with Russia's invasion of Ukraine are going to last for an extended period. So I think early on in the conflict, people were thinking about this in terms of weeks or months, but I think the right, right tone is to think about this in terms of years, and we'll present some information and some thoughts on, on why that's the case. To kick it off, price movements for both oil and wheat following the Ukraine conflict were historical in nature. So we have two charts from our article on the left-hand side. We're showing crude oil price changes. That red bar is the month-over-month -month change um, immediately following the conflict. Um, and then the blue bars are just to contextualize where this price, price shock um, sort of resides within, you know, the last, let's say, 50 years or so on the oil side. We, kinda, we have to go back to, you know, the 1970s or Iraq's invasion of um, Kuwait in order to see similar month over month price changes. And then when we look at you know, wheat on the right hand side, you know, in the context of historical you know, price shocks, we have to go back to you know, the early 1900s, sort of the Dust Bowl period in order to see similar types of price shocks. So to set the stage, this is a really big um, you know, shock to global commodity markets. And we sort of see that when we think about the historical context for energy and agriculture. Um, so why is this such a big deal? Um, it has to do with the, the exposures. So Russia and Ukraine count for large share of global production and exports for several major commodities. So the charts we're showing here are the shares of world production um, for key commodities, oil, wheat, natural gas, and corn, and then also the share of world exports on the right-hand side. So to put this within context, 
Russia accounts for 17% of global natural gas production um, and also a large share of, you know, wheat, corn, you know, those types of things. And then when we look at this from what they're providing to the global market, it's even it's an even higher concentration. So on the wheat side, Russia and Ukraine account for about 26% of global wheat exports. Russia alone accounts for 18% of global natural gas exports, most of which is going to um, to Western Europe. And then on the corn side, it's 17% of global exports. Um, so this is what we showed in the article, energy and agriculture, but there's a number of not obvious commodity exposures within these these regions as well. You know, so for example, on the metals market side, you know, Russia accounts for about 40% of, you know, of platinum earth metals, sort of palladium and these types of metals. Um, and then potash, Belarus and Ukraine account for 40% of global exports. Um, that feeds into fertilizers. So a key input for the production side of agriculture. Um, you're contributing to potentially higher um, agricultural prices. So why was this commodity shock so large? One of the contributing factors separate from the exposures were that um, inventories were lower declining both for energy and agriculture going into the shock. Um, so what we're showing is U.S. inventories for oil, which are at or below five-year averages, and then wheat inventories on the right-hand side um, that were you know, declining going into the shock. The reason why this matters is inventories serve as a buffer or a shock absorber within uh, price dynamics or within natural resource markets. So if there's lower inventories, there's sort of less margin or less buffer that um, you know, can be absorbed within the system. On the oil side, we saw declining inventories going into the shock, um, mostly because of lower levels of production um, during the pandemic, as well as high demand as economies recover and reopen. And then on the wheat side, Courtney, do you have any sort of um, anecdotes or highlights as to why we were seeing declining wheat inventories going into the shock? Yes, there there have been a couple of reasons on the wheat side. One has been um, kind of that period between 2014 and 2018 where it was about four years of really good weather um, all around the world, particularly in the US. We had very productive years. And so you can see inventories going up there. Since then, however, we've been hit by a few episodes globally and even in the US of drought. Uh, this year in particular, um, we've had a lot of drought in areas where we produce wheat, particularly hard red winter wheat. Um, in the U.S. and then uh, South America is also a big producer. They've had very hot, dry conditions, uh, which is not necessarily the best for winter wheat. And then China, who's actually the world's largest producer and consumer of wheat, uh, has had really wet conditions. So we kind of have had both of the extremes around the world and has contributed to uh, lower production and it's also a, a less valuable crop uh, you'll hear some refer to wheat as a weed uh, it's very similar to a weed you can grow it anywhere but it's not as valuable it does not generate as large revenues as corn and soybeans so um, with the increased technology seed technology with corn and soybeans you can grow it um, in areas that you haven't been able to grow corn and soybeans before so if a producer has the option to grow a higher value crop, they will do that. So over this time too, we've seen um, the, the land area that has produced wheat decline over time. So, so those are a couple of reasons uh, at leading up to this that we're already putting some pressure on uh, US wheat inventories in particular, but it'd be a similar story on a global scale too. Uh, so, yeah, very helpful. So going into this, genuine acute supply shock, there were a number of supply side factors contributing to those lower inventories or lower buffers, uh, be it on the energy side or on the agricultural side. So yeah, very, very interesting. Um, so what might we expect going into the end of the year? Um, so futures markets are indicating that we, we should experience higher prices through the end of the year. Um, we're showing the six month forward contract for oil on the left hand side as well as uh, for wheat on the right-hand side. So following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, uh, 
in mid-February, we saw this jump in prices, both for near-term spot prices, um, but as well as sort of market expectations for what we should see going into the end of the year. So kind of this level shift or higher price um, signaled by, um, you know, six months, six months out of uh, pricing for both energy and um, agriculture, suggesting that this the shock is is expected to be persistent when we think about it from a market's perspective. Uh, so what does this mean for consumers? Um, you know, the, the tone in the room or the conversation in the popular press or even at the grocery store or at the gasoline pump is that prices are on the rise and that's putting constraints on uh, consumers, households, et cetera. Uh, so higher commodity prices are resulting in higher consumer prices. Um, so we're, we're showing a, a series of CPI categories on the left-hand side for energy and uh, a series of categories for food on the right-hand side. Um, to big price changes in the last few months, uh, partially driven by the supply side shock on for Ru Russia invading Ukraine. So for oil, you know, nearly 50% um, year-over-year changes and motor fuel um, prices. Um, for airfare, a little over 30%. And even, you know, sort of the less obvious things like um, you know, heating for households and electricity. Um, the, the red dots were showing the five-year average. So when we think about these price changes in the context of what, what has happened over the last half, half decade, um, notably higher prices relative to maybe those more steady or um, modest price increases. And on the food side, you know, similar story, nearly 10% increases in food on average, um, cereal and bakery goods, which are more exposed to sort of those wheat, wheat production and wheat exports. And then again, I alluded to this idea of like the non-obvious thing. So fats and oils increased by 17%. Um, it's worth noting that you know, Russia, Russia and Ukraine account for, I believe it's roughly 77% of sunflower oil exports. So obviously not all fats and oils are sunflower oil, but certainly a contributing factor to um, higher prices and you know, fats and oils category. And something as simple as pet food, which we don't think about very often, but also near 8% increases. So across the board, this commodity shock is flowing through to higher prices um, for consumers. And we might expect across a number of those categories that those, those price increases are, are going to be sticky. Um, do you have any Do you have any thoughts on the con consumer side or the household side um, as it relates to this, Courtney? Yeah, just th this typically makes me think of um, these are two categories that we look at a lot from a monetary policy perspective. So I'm sure you know our attendees today know that you know the Federal Reserve's you know, dual mandate from a monetary policy perspective is price stability and full employment. And on the price stability piece, one of the really important um, factors or, or metrics that we follow is a consumer inflation expectation. So one of the, the other reasons that David and I felt it was important to track these things, even though they're, they're under the umbrella of, of areas that we cover, is because of the importance of these products for consumer inflation expectations. And we talk a bit about that in our article. There's research that has shown that both, particularly gasoline and food are very important because they're very salient to consumers. Consumers purchase these products more often than other products, uh, like you compare it to a washing machine, for example, that you might buy um, hopefully <laughs> every 10 years or more. Um, so these are products that people might buy every week. And so they can, any price increase that we see can have a much larger effect on consumer inflation expectations, which then can feed into uh, overall inflation as well. Um, and then just what this means for, you know, in the US, we're very lucky that we, you know, globally, we spend a very small share of our household disposable income on food in particular. On average, we spend about 9% on food. But if you start looking at lower income um, categories, you know, you, you may have, you know, students on free or reduced lunches, you know, these, these types of households spend a much larger share of their overall income on food um, and energy products. So also a very important thing to follow. So how are people reacting to these prices? Might they be in, and I'm sure that we'll get into this more, but when you're thinking about the consumer side in particular, it's, 
you know, maybe some substitution going on. You might start to see some demand disruption, people buying less, uh, figuring out how to, you know, maybe change their practices in order to not have to spend so much of their uh, money on different products that are our basic needs in terms of a household budget. Thanks, David. Yeah, so big, big driver for inflation expectations and also just those just I, so you teed me up well for the next slide, which is this idea of distributional effects. So in the United States, it's households and income levels, but globally there's distribution effects as well. So as a as a large energy and agricultural producer, as well as exporter, the US is su surprisingly you know, partially buffered from this global commodity shock. So in the US, we we export a lot of you know, oil, petroleum products, as well as you know, wheat and agricultural products, but that's not true for other countries. So when we see higher prices in the US, we are still subject to global commodity markets. In other countries, they might actually see genuine scarcity or the unavailability of certain things. Um, so in, in this chart, we're showing the percent change in price um, for a series of commodities, just like we did in the previous few slides across a, a number of regions. So we've got the US on the left, Europe in the middle, and then we've got South Africa and Turkey. So you'll notice that um, big green bar for natural gas. Um, the Eurozone is highly exposed to Russian natural gas exports. To, to provide some context, 70% of Russian natural gas exports make their way to Europe, and that's about 48 to 50% of Eurozone natural gas production. So when Russia invaded Ukraine, that created a lot of uncertainty around the availability of this you know, critical commodity to that region, and you start to see these um, higher higher prices in the Eurozone for natural gas. Then we highlighted South Africa and Turkey, um, notably because they're, they're exposed to um, food exports from Russia and Ukraine. Um, we would have highlighted other countries like Egypt and a few other African countries who are also highly exposed, but the availability of data made it so that we just highlight these countries. So again, distributional effects not just within the country, but also across the globe. Um, so we 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 have challenges in those higher prices, but these other places may have the uh, may have challenges as it relates to you know, true availability. Um, so when we think about those distributional effects, um, I'm going to highlight um, eurozone natural gas markets and U.S. exports as sort of an illustrative example. We could have done similar things for for agriculture agriculture. Uh, but I thought this was a, an acute example worth highlighting for the educators on the call. Uh, so European and domestic natural gas prices are higher following Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, with noticeable volatility in the European markets. So the red line is Dutch natural gas prices and the blue line is domestic natural gas prices. So we've seen an uptick in both uh, Eurozone natural gas prices as well as domestic natural gas prices with a, a noticeable year over year increase in, in those Dutch prices um, with a lot of volatility. So that's the spikes and drops um, in that red line uh, following um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And then that tick up in the red line in recent weeks has to do with disruptions in US exports from some of our liquefied natural gas terminals, as well as rising concerns over Russia potentially shutting off flows to Central Europe. And um, this has implications for um, Eurozone producers, their manufacturing sector, also their households, um, you know, higher prices for heating homes and these types of things, but also the possibility that they may have to um, you know, decide who gets available, um, available resources if it comes to that. And when we think about the US, um, we, we are trying to help the Eurozone by exporting and um, sort of backfilling some of those, those challenges as it relates to the availability of natural gas in particular, but we're limited in our capacity. Um, so this chart is showing um, in the bottom section sort of a stacked area on where the US is exporting liquefied natural gas. So this is natural gas that comes out of a well. We turn that into a liquid that goes onto a ship and then gets exported to a foreign country and then turned into a gas again put on pipes and then run through utilities and home heating. Um, so you'll notice that green wedge on the right hand side. So at the end of last year, we were exporting about 26% of our total liquefied natural gas was making its way to the Eurozone. 
And then at the beginning of this year, we're closer to 60%. So we're reallocating shipments of our liquefied natural gas to those to, to the Eurozone to help backfill um, some of the challenges that they're they're facing with um, you know, Russian imports. But we are limited in our capacity. So that red line is our total export capacity for liquefied gas. Um, and basically, we export whatever we can. So you need to build new facilities. That takes time. When we think about that export capacity, we're only adding about 6% to liquefied natural gas exports over the next year. And over the next uh, three to five years, we're only adding about one third to our total capacity. So we're trying, but we're just constrained. Um, and the same could be said about um, you know, the agricultural sector. So I don't know if you have any, obviously we didn't show the data, Courtney, but do you have any thoughts on how the agricultural sector matches to what we're doing on the energy side? Yes, and and as David knows, I think that, that this is a really interesting chart, one that we didn't include uh, in the article that we've been referencing, but but one that I'm glad David included here because it is a good point. You know, how much you'll hear a lot in the news related to, um, you know, on the ag side, the uh, our administration in the U.S. Um, trying to encourage producers to produce more so that we do have a greater capacity for exports, um, particularly to you know countries around the world that are net importers of food products instead of net exporters. Uh, on the ag side, you know we do know that there there is a ceiling in terms of what capacity we have to export, but it's a little harder to track just because um, you know when this all happened, you know if you look at the inventory numbers we showed, it's you know, in my mind, if you take completely take Russia and Ukraine out of the equation, it looks like we have enough inventories to, you know, help supply the rest of the world, even if we weren't to produce more. But it's, you know, understanding where those inventories are, you know, are they private? Are they available? Um, and then you also have a situation where countries that are net exporters, you know, maybe put in place uh, embargoes or or block exports because they're trying to take care of their own people um and so so i guess all that to say just on the ag side it's just, it is a similar situation it's a little more difficult to track on from a data perspective um but it is true that you know i i'm sitting here in oklahoma uh where you know not only how much capacity do we have to export but also what are we currently able to produce this year with the weather constraints that we've been facing. In Oklahoma, for example, we're currently in the middle of uh, winter wheat harvest, and the projections are that we'll harvest 50% less than what we harvested last year. So for us, when you look at, you know, David had mentioned refining capacity. Um, well, on the, the ag side, it's really just more how much can we produce uh, in terms of land area and, and what mother nature uh, kind of allows, so to speak. Yeah, so different driving factors, but similar story in terms of yep. what capacity and what it takes to sort of backfill some of this uh, you know, disruption that uh, the Eastern Europe is facing. Uh, and when we think about duration, so we've touched on a number of different topics um, that would suggest that this is likely to be long duration, whether or not that's from the consumer price perspective or what markets are expecting. But historically, when we think about conflicts of this size, or sanction events. So what we didn't talk about throughout this presentation, but we're happy to, happy to get to in, in the Q&A is this idea that sanctions um, have really sort of been imposed globally across um, you know, countries. And some of that's um, government, some of that's the private sector. When we look at sanction events historically, which is what this chart is showing, this didn't make it in the article, but you're getting sort of a sneak peek into our thought process and some of the things that contributed to how we're thinking about this. Um, across, you know, a little over 1,100 sanction events since the mid-1950s, the median sanction event um, persists for about four years. Uh, large conflicts of this variety, the average sanction or the average conflict lasts for a couple of years. And we highlighted a couple recent sanction events um, notably Crimea, which took place in 2014, um, that's still ongoing. And then some of the SWIFT or financial sanctions that were implemented on Iran in 2012 and 2016. 
Um, you know, financial sanctions as well as physical sanctions are being levied on Russia at this point, given the scale of the conflict and sort of historical precedent. Um, the thought process should be that this is um, an event that's likely to persist for years and not months. Um, and I think you know, markets, policymakers, and folks across the globe are starting to see that. Um, it was, I think, there might have been a little bit more hope or perception that this was going to be, you know, weeks or months um, early on in February, but. Um, it's pretty clear that this is, is likely going to be a, a longer duration event. Um, so in summary, Russia's invasion of Ukraine initiated a historical global commodity shock, so a supply shock both for energy and ag, at a time when markets were already tight. Those are those low inventories or low buffers. Um, as a large producer and exporter of energy commodities as well as agriculture, the U.S. is somewhat buffered from that disruption. We're seeing higher prices, there are distributional effects across households, uh, but we're unlikely to see some of the scarcity issues that are, are likely to be prevalent in other areas of the globe. And although the U.S. is exporting more liquefied natural gas to Europe, we are limited in our capacity in the short run to alleviate energy disruptions in Europe. So this is one illustrative example of sort of the constraints that other countries have, including the U.S., in terms of you know, helping out the Europeans. And the duration of this disruption is expected to last for an extended period. So sort of these ongoing, um, not obvious sort of spillover effects over time. And uh, with that, I think Courtney and I are happy to have an open discussion and Q&A with uh, anyone that we have on the call. Great, great. So many questions, so many questions. So uh, for those uh, who may not have heard early on, we are taking your questions at any time through the Q&A panel. So please continue to submit those as you have them. And also um, keep in mind uh, what your students might be thinking as well as you submit those questions. So David and Courtney, we've had a, um, a few come in here. Um, one of them, you know, is tied to when you talked about the, the profitability of, you know, certain commodities, so such as wheat, um, when there's a lower profitability um, of certain commodities, is that going to have, you know, is it going to make it more or less shock prone overall? And I'll let either of you respond to that. Yeah, and David may have an analogy on the energy side too. I don't know, that's a really interesting question. I don't know that it's necessarily the profitability of wheat, but maybe just the uh, like industrial organization of the wheat industry. Uh, it's it is definitely one of the commodities that's most closely tied to food, uh, because as you all know, you know, wheat is a direct input into uh, bakery items, cereal. Uh, because commonly, you know, I'm an ag economist. I'm definitely an ag production economist, so I tend to work at the, you know, at, at the start of the supply chain at the producer level. Um, and supply chains for agriculture are very complex, but wheat is one. And so because of the complexity, you typically don't see actually a very high correlation between commodity prices and food prices. Wheat is the one exception to that. Um, and so, and because of that, you know, wheat producers tend to have um, set, you know, longer term contracts. You know, they, they typically, if you're growing wheat, you know where it's going. You know, you have those contracts put into place. They're very long-term uh, bakeries or flour mills tend to hold very high inventories. Um, so it is a, a pretty shock-proof supply chain. So this situation is quite unique compared to both the historical perspective, but also, um, you know, David had that first slide on historical shocks for wheat. And so it's really been since the Russia grain embargo of the 1970s and the Dust Bowl since we've seen this type of shock because I and, and mostly because I think it's how wheat supply chains operate. Um, they're typically very predictable. So I think that that is one thing that contributes to how large this shock is and just how unexpected it was because you know, if you're a wheat producer, you typically don't um, have to you know, worry about these types of things. Uh, but uh, in most of the most recent seven years, prices have been pretty low. So they, so that's been kind of the, the issue. Um, so, so yes, I would say it's just, it's more the structure of the supply chain that makes it less uh, shock prone. Whereas, uh, 
uh, and it's such a, a very competitive global market. You know, if you look at soybeans as a counter example, it's quite a bit more you know shock prone because the U.S. and Brazil are really, and to a lesser extent Argentina, are really the only players in the game. So if something happens in one of those countries. Or if something happens in China, where which is the largest consumer of soybeans globally, you know that can really cause some larger ripple effects. Whereas, you know, like I said, wheat being much easier to grow, you can grow it more places. There's a lot more producers of wheat around the world. It's much more competitive, and tends to have uh, fewer shocks. So, David, is, is there any kind of counter example on the energy side? No, I think it's it's similar, but a little bit different. So on the on the energy side, it, the question had had a nature of you know cost structures and you know profitability, um, sort of our profitability. So there's a little bit of a tension in the energy sector where like producers are still subject to higher prices, just like households are. So you're starting to see producer price indices for um, you know oil and gas companies on the rise at a time when prevailing commodity prices are also going up. It just so happens that the prevailing commodity prices, oil and natural gas, are going up faster than their cost structure. Um, so that contributes to um, more investment activity, more drilling activity, and more supply coming online because of that profitability. And depending on structural factors, that can be slower or faster depending on the conditions. Um, on the supply chain side, energy supply chains are maybe a little bit more fragile or complex than wheat. Um, wheat you can consume as a raw commodity or it, ha or it can be processed into a food product. Um, we don't consume crude oil, we consume refined products, gasoline, diesel, jet fuel. So you have these long global supply chains that are run through you know, what could be considered critical nodes. So refining centers like the United States, Russia has a lot of refining capacity. Um, so it's one thing to have sort of the raw commodity disrupted because of war, but you also have some complexity on the supply chain side for energy um, because you have pipelines and infrastructure and all of those things have to move through every um, step in the process in order to get to um, you know, the pump or get to uh, the natural gas at your home. Mm -hmm. Okay, all righty. So sticking um, with energy, David, you know, we were uh, because of these, these shocks, we're looking for these alternative energy sources. What can we do or what else can we do to become more elastic um, when it comes to um, the, the energy supply? It's a great question. Actually, I'm, I'm going to respond to this one in like three different ways, and hopefully that's helpful for the educators on the call, and they could transmute that into whatever sort of like um, lesson plans they would want to put together. So on the elasticity piece, um, I'll go to sort of pandemic world. A lot of folks are working from home a little bit more. So it could be that structurally, and I don't have data to sort of like support this, but with folks working from home and having that optionality between commuting or not, sort of those consumption choices may have changed, at least in the United States and some of the developed world throughout the pandemic. So it is possible that at least on transportation fuels and some of these types of things, um, consumers have already become more elastic, or at least components of our economy have become more elastic, which I think is interesting. And we'll see how that plays out at high prices and whether or not that promotes this idea of demand destruction, people just saying, well, I'm going to you know, work from home an extra day this week because gasoline prices are high or something along these lines. Whereas maybe pre-pandemic, it was you have to bike to work or you have to take the bus. Those options still exist, but now you have this sort of third thing in play. Um, on the longer term structural change, I don't think it helps much with short term elasticity, but relative prices become really, really important. And Courtney probably has some ideas on how this plays out in the agricultural sector as well. But an energy that becomes, you know, five dollars per gallon of gasoline. Maybe if you're a two-car household, you start to think seriously about an electric vehicle, and then that sort of changes the elasticity of demand for liquid fuels because all of a sudden, you know, maybe you drive your electric car a little bit more than you drive your, um, you know, internal combustion engine vehicle. Um, and then from a like more structural perspective, so that's a consumption decision with some infrastructure behind it. 
Uh, when you think about system scale energy electricity, um, it could be that countries try to move more quickly to um, lower energy intensity or lower fossil fuel intensity options like renewables, wind, solar, these types of things. So that was already taking place in the Eurozone pre-invasion. Um, my suspicion is that with high natural gas prices and maybe high electricity prices or scarcity of fossil fuels for like energy purposes, household or manufacturing, there might be this impetus to say, well, we need to do this faster. And maybe that carries forward those structural changes and acts as a catalyst to move more quickly to where they were already headed. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on the elasticity side for agriculture. It's probably a slightly different story, Courtney. Yeah, so, you know, for for the ag side, you know, this usually comes into play on what we call the white commodities. So uh, sugar, cotton, and rice. Uh, and so, you know, whenever we saw, you know, the last run up in commodity prices was about 2012, 2013, when we had massive drought um, across the country. And, uh, and it really drove all commodity prices up across the board, kind of like we're seeing now. Well, one of the outcomes of that was, you know, the saying is high prices cure high prices. Uh, so, so for on from an ag context, and that's because, you know, you start to see demand destruction for those commodities. So another example would be eggs, which if anyone has bought eggs at the grocery store right now, you know that egg prices are also very high. And so in, you know, products like cotton and sugar and eggs, you know, these are typically inputs into food you know, processed food, manufacturing. And so what manufacturers will do is to start finding lower price substitutes, um, thereby you know, lowering demand for those products and then supply can catch up. And then once that happens, then prices start to come down. But the risk there from a long-term perspective is that those manufacturers, you know, that, that's a sticky, uh, quote, uh, to pardon the pun, situation um because they may decide just to continue to use you know like for cotton for example synthetics uh instead or for eggs egg substitutes you know i'm sure those of you who bake at home know that you can make a flax egg or a chia egg if you either are allergic to eggs or or in my case sometimes you find out you don't have anything once you've started the baking or any eggs once you started the baking process so so these are very similar things that households deal with but also um, you know, entities downstream in the supply chain, such as food manufacturers will also face. And so they can decide to make those substitutes and, and that, you know, affects supply and demand of these commodities and can ultimately, um, you know, direct the market and prices on, you know, which way to go. So Courtney, are there any concerns right now about major food shortages? or crises um, either in the US or around the world? Yes, yeah, so we actually have a, a chart in the article that's about, you know, not just the kind of, we showed in the presentation slide deck, um, you know, the sh global share of production and exports from Russia and Ukraine. And then in the article, we also show, you know, where their exports go um, and, the the interesting thing is that you know we we don't get into this a lot but the US is not very dependent on Russia and Ukraine you know we're we're really not for these commodities dependent on imports anyway we're a net exporter but we especially do not have a very large trade relationship with Russia and Ukraine and in fact the whole North American continent really doesn't you know Mexico and Canada don't either um so uh so then where do Russia and Ukraine you know, typically export. These are the areas that we that are most likely to see some form of food scarcity. So these would be Southeast Asia, North Africa, um, and um, and the Middle East. Uh, and unfortunately, these are also all three areas that are typically net importers of food in general. And so not only are they commonly net importers, but they also import a lot from. Russia and Ukraine, the Black Sea region. And, you know, another thing to kind of, you know, that that maybe this could be interesting for students to think about is if you look at the populations of these countries, um, you may have noticed that, uh, 
they don't look as as important of producers as what they are exporters and that's because this is a very fertile area of the world um the black sea region um a lot of you know what we might call black soil it's very productive um so these countries even though they don't have a huge land area ukraine in particular they have very productive soil and very small populations relative to like the united states um, so they don't need to consume as you know all of the these materials they produce so they're they're able to export those and the countries that they commonly export them to um, are countries that don't necessarily have very fertile soil don't have the climate to produce these types of food commodities and so um, you know those would be the areas like North Africa the Middle East um, Southeast Asia and Southeast Asia too just because these are countries that are very densely populated. Um, and so the demand is very strong there for food products as well. Okay. Okay. So we've got lots of things in place here. As you've mentioned, we have the sanctions and embargoes. We have, you know, this, this post recovery from a pandemic. Um, and then of course we have the conflict itself. So. You know, as teachers are talking to students, you know, how can they uh, separate the impact or the effect of each of these, or is there a way to do that um, on prices and and what we can see, you know, longer term? And I'll, you know, this question is for both of you. So that's a that's a great question. So making this real, and, I don't, and I'm not sure exactly what level of economics you're teaching, but if you think about the opening up of economies, that would be a, a shift in demand to the positive side, right? Um, a lot of these other things are supply shocks. So an up into the left on the supply curve. So if I were thinking about a lesson plan and thinking about the interrelationship between A, B, C, D, it would be like, well, this happened. What's the shift in the supply curve or what's the shift in, is it a shift in the supply curve? Is it a shift in the demand curve? And then you could break that down by commodity or by subsector. Um, the net effect, the contribution, like to do that econometrically, or even like with a reason, some reasonable uncertainty band is really hard because all of these things are happening near simultaneously. So it's difficult when you see a higher oil price how much of that is due to a reopening of global economies relative to energy supply availability or the possibility of energy supply availability out of Russia. Um, and then you have the whole sanction component, which would serve to impact both supply and demand, whether or not you're um, demanding things from Russia or whether or not Russia is supplying those things and just has less capacity to produce or export. Um, so I think there's, I mean, that's that's kind of my view on it and how I would sort of make this real. And if I were doing a lesson plan, you could easily have a one or two pager to say, hey, we're thinking about wheat markets. This happened. Show me the shift in supply demand, whether or not that's US or Russia, and then show me the spillover effects into some other market, right? So maybe that increases the demand for rice because relative prices of wheat go up or something along those lines. Um, how, how would you approach this, Courtney? Yeah, I think that, you know, the one on the pandemic piece, you know, we we think a lot about, you know, the crop commodities from a Russia Ukraine perspective, both corn and wheat. Um, the really interesting example from the pandemic side would be the meat supply chain, particularly beef and pork, um, because that was really the supply chain that was affected by the pandemic. Uh, <laughs> shameless plug. We also have an article on that. <laughs> Um, and and that and that's always the first thing we do as economists. I, I, I don't want to speak for David, but um, he mentioned the supply and demand curves. When I'm thinking about these issues and before writing an article, the first thing I do, and I get together with our ag team, and you know we do we I draw by hand the supply and demand curves and how I think about uh, it, what's happening. So and the why the meat one is so interesting because it was a completely you know, the shock basically broke the supply chain. And so the effects for producers and consumers were completely different. Um, you know, all of a sudden you just have this, you know, complete shut off of demand at meat packing plants. 
um, because they were shut down from COVID. So, you know, what does that do to the command curve? It makes it go straight up and down. And um, and then, you know, what does that mean for beef producers? Well, the price of their, you know, cattle drops pretty significantly. But on the other end of the supply chain, you have an increase in demand because at the time of the pandemic, people were rushing to grocery stores to buy meat, but then you also have this shut off of supply. And so prices for consumers goes up. So I think for, for students to be able to think through that, um, you know, in the supply and demand uh, diagram framework, it, it's a very real um, example of, you know, these crazy shock type events that can happen. And so, you know, the Russia-Ukraine war scenario um, from a wheat and corn perspective would be, you know, very similar on uh, the supplies, but, but uh, whereas, you know, the pandemic was almost more of a, you know, supply and demand case, Russia, Ukraine being much more focused on supply. Um, it, you know, you know, our, so I would say that from a modeling conception framework, that last uh, kind of survival curve that David showed, that was, a, we work with a PhD political scientist who kind of is a big data uh, scientist person who does that. I would say my modeling conceptions are just much more like pen to paper thinking through these things, you know, conceptually, how do they play out, you know, and, and really kind of on a high school, you know, level, so to speak, that we're thinking through these things and then we're applying um, the data later on the back end, you know, if we think that this kind of needs more in-depth data analysis. And if so, the educators on the Call really wanted to get fancy. You could go back to that first question or that the earlier question about elasticities, right? And think about short term, medium term, and long term elasticities. So in commodity markets, natural resources markets in general, they're they're typically inelastic markets. You you need to eat tomorrow and you need to put gasoline in your car. And that's that's a true statement where you need to turn on the heat for your house. You can make adjustments over a medium term, weeks and months and then can make structural adjustments over years if those high prices prevail. So you could think about shifts in demand and supply as well as sort of changes in elasticity, sort of tilts in those demand and supply curves over time. And then the interrelationship between market A and market B. And you could do the simple version of this, but you could also do the extra credit version if you want. <laughs> right. So for those maybe who aren't as familiar, can either of you touch on what some of those sanctions or or uh, embargoes are that were put in place specifically due to the, the Russia-Ukraine conflict? I'll ha highlight just a few on the energy side. Um, so the US is scheduled to stop taking Russian crude oil. It, for those that aren't on the, or aren't familiar so much with the, how the global energy system works and sort of where the US sits within that, we, we have refineries that need the type of crude that Russia produces. There are a number of other suppliers we can get that from, but um, it does take a large portion of our potential like like supplier base out of the mix. Um, it's not a big movement for the US because we don't take a, like, a large share of our consumption isn't Russian crudes. Uh, the Eurozone is leaning towards the same, both for coal and for oil. Um, so they're looking to sanction embargo, um, you know, Russian crude and coal. Um, there's some tension around the natural gas because they are highly dependent on Russian natural gas. Um, and then there's a number of monetary sort of financial sanctions that um, have basically cut Russia out of the um, global interbank transfer system, so SWIFT. So those have binding constraints on the ability for Russians to transact globally. Um, and that's just on the official government levied sanctions, which have been well coordinated across most major countries. Um, there's been a number of like idiosyncratic private private company type of embargoes or sanctions that have been levied on the same. And I'm a little less familiar with the agricultural side. It's my understanding that they're it's pretty limited. But uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Courtney? Yes, it's you, you know I sometimes I say. You, you, it's a, a bit taboo to weaponize food. Uh, so that's been one that is uh, that hasn't been touched as much. Uh, 
you know, it's typically excluded from sanctions uh, because, you know, just, you know, wanting to make sure countries have the food that they need and people have the food that they need. Um, so, but at the same time, you know, there, there have been some issues with getting the, product, the actual products out uh, because there's really only one major export point coming out of the Black Sea region, that's Odessa. Um, and, you know, whether or not countries will accept agricultural commodities, if they either think, you know, from Russia, if they think they've been stolen from Ukraine or, or different geopolitical issues like that. Now, what we have seen, though, has been more common is export embargoes. Um, India would be an example. Um, but it, it's interesting to me, you know, you see the headlines of these uh, India on on wheat and then, you know, Indonesia on palm oil was another example recently. Uh, but then if you really look into the fine print, um, it's typically uh, it, it not um, like for Indonesia, for example, that the type of palm oil that they were actually, you know, embargo or saying that they, you know, putting export restrictions on was actually a very small share. It was like processed palm oil that it was a very small share of their overall exports. India is another one that, you know, you might see export restrictions coming out of their country. They're actually not a major exporter of wheat anyway, because they're kind of like China. They produce a lot of wheat, but they consume, a, you know, a very large majority of what they produce uh, in their own country. So, um, you know, if you start hearing about the export restrictions from Brazil, or Argentina, there was an example of that. I think those are the kinds that are a bit more concerning on a global scale because you have these major producers that are also major exporters. Um, but I think the other thing to watch too is, you know, we've seen really strong exports coming out, out of the US and a lot of that has been driven by China. And, and a big reason for that is for China wanting to kind of stockpile uh, commodities. So they have, uh, you know, fairly large inventories that they're holding of commodities because they have you know, the world's largest population. And so that's, I think, another thing that we're monitoring. Um, you know, that's great for U.S. producers to have such strong export demand from China uh, because it certainly supports prices that our producers are paid, but from a global scale uh, that can make, uh, you know, global inventories and distributions ex-China a bit tighter. So considering that we are the Federal Reserve and we conduct monetary policy to try to, you know, curb some of these, these, uh, these effects, what can monetary policy do or what can we do when it comes to our monetary policy tools to, you know, affect all of these issues positively? So I'll touch on it briefly. I we, and then Courtney, I'm sure you have some thoughts on the ag side. We, monetary policy can affect the demand side of the equation. Um, it has limited capacity to affect supply side decisions, but through longer term pricing of capital investment projects. But that takes time and takes time to flow through. Um, so it's um, near term pricing of you know, essentially the value of money and, and debt and these types of things, and that can temper demand if you're raising rates or rolling off a balance sheet. But what we talked about in this article, it's a lot of supply side stuff. So there's just not much that monetary policy can do to alleviate some of those supply side issues that we highlight um, either in the presentation or in the article. And uh, Courtney, maybe you've got thoughts. Yeah, I I mean I would agree with that. I think that it's uh it, it's important for, for um, a monetary policy perspective to know though, you know, where that pressure is coming from um and uh to be able to uh, because I I do think that you know, if, if we knew that this was just a you know, a demand scenario, I think that you know It'd be interesting to see how monetary policy would be a little, you know, whether or not monetary policy would be different. That there may actually be some research out there about that. I might have to go look that up because that would be interesting to see, 
uh, historically, you know, ha how has monetary policy reacted, whether something was, you know, maybe primarily a supply or demand shock, but um, but yeah, I, I pretty much agree with David um, from my, uh, you know, microeconomist perspective, living in a macroeconomist world there, uh, you know, it, uh, it is difficult because the inflation does seem to be coming from this major supply shock, but what we're trying to do is um, to maybe slow demand to a point where we can start to see some easing of inflation. Um, because it, it has been, you know, if you look at, you know, the data that I keep seeing um, come up a lot is just how much U.S. households have in savings. Um, and so that's allowed households to continue to be strong um, consumers and have a lot of purchase power for both goods and services. So, um so, you know, that that all plays into when we start making monetary policy decisions, how successful that uh, those policies can be with helping us, you know, rein in these scenarios and, and also thinking about, um, you know, how long term this may be as well. So. Yeah, and speaking of that, that long term, you mentioned that, you know, the, the effects will probably, you know, continue for quite some time. Um, you know, although when you look at the conflict itself, there doesn't seem to be much progress, you know, uh, so does that mean that, you know, we could see this kind of just level out and not worsen um, over the longer term? Yeah, so we, I don't. Go ahead, Corey. Okay. I don't so mean. We, we also, our, our co-author, um, uh, Tom Cook, also looked at this from a, a, so, you know, there's kind of two things going on. There's the war that's really the, the shock to Ukraine as a producer, and there's the sanctions that, you know, are the constraint for Russia as a producer. Um, and so, so David showed kind of the, the survival projections that we had for, from a sanctions perspective, which really you know, affects Russia, but we also did a similar analysis for the war um, in which would be kind of what ultimately affects Ukraine as a producer, particularly on the ag side. And it's very, you know, the results are very similar, you know, and, and from talking to Tom and, you know, the things that I've read based on, you know, the war and previous experience, you know, one of the first things Tom said when we started talking about these issues is we need to start thinking about this in years instead of months. Um, but then to me, there's a lot of uncertainty around, okay, even if the war does go on, what does that mean for production? You know, how does, how does war, you know, affect producers being able to get in the field to be able to plant, fertilize, harvest? Um, those are the kinds of things we're thinking about because once that's disrupted in one year, the effects continue you know, on both, you know, because of the, the large, you know, share of production exports that Ukraine accounts for, those effects can have spillovers and those effects can last for a long time because, you know, Ukraine is very similar to the U.S. You know, we typically produce one crop a year. So, um, and then, you know, what does that look like next year, even if the war ends today? Um, you know, can they rebuild, you know, you hear stories about tanks or trucks in fields, mortar shells, you know, how, you know, how long does it take to clean up a field, be able to plant again, um, and just kind of rebuild that infrastructure, uh, to produce and distribute commodities. So, um, so the, so I think just the destructive nature of war implies that it can have very, you know, long-term effects on production and distribution of food commodities. Similar on the energy side. So it's, uh, yeah, hopefully that the, the sort of conflict, conflict sort of humanitarian piece that sort of simmers down and um, becomes maybe a little less severe than what we've experienced over the last few months. But for energy production out of Russia, a lot of the global majors have decided to remove themselves from Russia oil and gas production. Uh, so there's an unknown sort of longer term supply 
issue there if they're not able to get the technology, the equipment, or the expertise to continue to maintain their energy sector. The International Energy Agency has done a little bit of work on this and looked at what the like longer term, you know, again, years and not months type of production issues, what that looks like in, in Russia, and they're expecting noticeable declines in Russian um, oil and presumably natural gas production just because they can't get the things that they need to produce the stuff that the rest of the world is trying to sort of consume. So there's those are the things that are a little bit over the horizon or not obvious today, but will likely make their way into the conversation or continue to be part of the conversation going forward. So are we likely to see then some more supply chain, you know, system uh, disruption um, when we look on a global scale? And we'll say, you know, regarding energy first, David. Yeah, I'm going to make a best guess. I think we haven't yet seen this fully play out in the energy sector. Um, and I, I think there's any number of reasons to indicate that that's true. Um, you know, the thing about conflict is it. You know, there's a number of pipelines that run through Ukraine, for example. So if you have a war that's still taking place in Ukraine, you have physical infrastructure that could be disrupted just from the conflict side, let alone from the production side and the exports. Um, out of Russia. So I, I think there's a few more dominoes and a few more sort of chapters in this book. Um, and I can allude to what those might look like, but the world has been a very surprising place over the last couple of years. So the answer is, I don't know, but I expect to be surprised. Okay. And what about you, Courtney? Yeah, I, you know, in 2020, I remember speaking at a conference that was, uh, you know, it was in the midst of the global pandemic. It was right after we saw um, beef and pork supply chain shutting down. And the topic of the conference was on supply chain resiliency. So I think even because of the pandemic, we started hearing a lot more talk about, you know, what does that mean? What does it look like? How can supply chains transition to become more shock resistant? Um, you've probably heard the term, you know, moving from just in case, you know, from just in time to just in case supply chain. So we've seen a lot more infrastructure in terms of, you know, warehousing, storage, um, a lot of conversations about price risk versus uh, thinking about um, supply chain or inventory or, you know, customer satisfaction risk. So companies along the supply chain being willing to pay higher prices to make sure they have um, materials on hand to meet consumer needs, because it is a risk to not have what a consumer needs and then lose that customer. Um, and so I think we've already seen some of these transitions occur. And then Russia and Ukraine happened as supply chains were trying to um, become more shock resistant, but a war is just such a large uh, shock that, but, but I think that because of this, you know, piling on to effects from the pandemic, I think we're going to continue to see some transitions and it will be interesting to see this play out, how it affects consumers. It is very concerning to me, though, as an economist, because on the ag side, uh, you know, prices that producers are paid are typically very correlated with inventory. So I kind of get a little nervous when I start seeing like, inventory build because that what that means for farm finances ultimately. So, you know, will we get to a point where we get prices under control and then all these companies, you know, businesses along supply chains have much higher inventories than what they probably did before the pandemic, then what does that mean? You know, do we go the other way very quickly? I think that is, you know, could be a risk to monitor too. You know, how how, you know, once we do get inflation under control, you know, what are the um, risks to the to the downside after that? You know, thinking even much longer term, and part of that is, I think, supply chain transitions and how supply chains are reacting to these uh, various shocks. I think you you said something I I think was really important there, Courtney, and is a bit of a silver lining for me is this idea of you know, supply chain resiliency over time, and that doesn't happen tomorrow, doesn't happen maybe in the next you know six months, but could happen over. You know, years. So this this war in Ukraine, I think, is 
in an in a list indicative of risk that was maybe sort of simmering underneath the surface and then that becomes manifest. So from like the Europeans perspective, they're going to think about what their energy diversity looks like. And there's short term implications of that all the way to the long term implications of energy transitions. And the same could be true across sectors. So that could be manufacturing. That could be any number of components of an economy where you're just thinking about where you get stuff, where all of that, those things flow and then where those get distributed. And maybe that regionalizes supply chains and maybe creates a little bit more resiliency over time so that the world is less subject to these surprises or these bigger shocks at a later date. Or at least that's the story I like to tell myself because it's it is it's an unknown, but could be a positive unknown if that if it were to play out that way. Yeah, and let's let's stick on the positive side a little bit more <laughs> for a minute. You know, um, it, as uh, teachers might be using this as an example, right, to teach some, you know, basic economic concepts. You know, we've got unintended consequences, I'm sure, that that have resulted from this. What are those beneficial ones that that you've seen or that we can um, maybe forecast seeing in the future? So on the energy side, we touched on it, but the acceleration of renewable energy transitions, right? So there's reasons why economies are moving towards lower carbon, cleaner types of fuels and types of energy. So this, in my mind, serves as a catalyst because of how salient and important relative pricing is. If all of a sudden your natural gas prices are really, really high, you're not gonna wanna run natural gas electricity production in your country or your region, and you're gonna wanna switch faster into this other thing. And I, I think there's good reasons to do that completely separable from that relative short-term price. Um, and I, that would be maybe one of the bright spots on the energy side is to think about this quickening or this like faster shift towards renewable energy or cleaner energy or more efficient energy technologies. Yeah, the, the, I like that question because I think that one of the positives has been, uh, you know, we've been seeing stronger uh, what we would refer to as agricultural credit conditions for you know several quarters now coming out of the second half of 2020 and into the first quarter of 2022. So, you know, and that is under, you know, one of the other pillars of the Federal Reserve System, which is bank supervision and uh, you know monitoring the safety and soundness of banks. And a lot of the banks in our region and the Kansas City Fed region are considered agricultural banks, which means they uh, a large share of their ag or their total loan portfolio is uh, servicing farmers. And so one of the things that you see when we see high commodity prices, that means that farmers are getting paid higher prices for the commodities that they produce thereby their their finances as a farm business and farm household are stronger and so they're able to you know get in a, a stronger financial position uh repay loans and and not you know have as much loan demand um and so those are all things that we monitor and track um in the Kansas City you know uh Federal Reserve region so i think that that is certainly a positive i know that even you know, despite high commodity prices, though, there's still been a lot of concerns on the ag side. Um, but, uh, you know, because there can be a lot of issues from a marketing standpoint when you do see prices, you know, what we call going limit up every day. Um, and so, uh, uh, but still, I think from, from a positive perspective, that's been one of the big ones that's come out uh, just because so much of our region is rural and uh, farming dependent. Um, so it's it's very good for our, you know, the Kansas City Fed region for the agricultural industry to be doing well. And that typically happens when we see higher commodity prices. So something else that, that might be a positive looking forward um, is this question about, you know, from an energy perspective, is the U.S., you know, looking to replace um, Russia in the supply of energy sources um, so that there's less reliance on Russia. And then from the ag side, you know, is that happening, you know, potentially as well? 
Replace would be a strong word. Russia exports a lot of natural gas to the Eurozone. So, and they're still receiving a good majority of that. I, I do think this shock likely accelerates permitting for what they call liquefaction capacity on the coast. So the supply chain for US, LN, or US gas to make its way to the Eurozone is we drill, we put that on a pipe, that goes into a manufacturing facility, typically in the Gulf Coast, gas gets turned into a liquid put on ship and then exported. So I do see that likely happening at a quicker pace, or we might just might see more projects in the Gulf Coast come online to get more natural gas from the US to the Eurozone. But they need a lot of natural gas in order to backfill what they're getting from Russia. So if they want to sort of balance everything out with liquefied natural gas, it's going to have to come from you know, the US, but also other partners like you know, Australia or um, you know, the Middle East. Um, so that would be a positive for um, producers and exporters from the United States, but I think it takes time. Those are structural changes. That's a lot of infrastructure that has to come into play. And then when we flip that around and think about distributional effects, there's some tension there, right? So if we're exporting more of our natural gas to foreign countries, that becomes a demand that U.S. consumers have to compete against, right? So about 10% of our natural gas production is exported as liquefied natural gas, rough numbers. If we increase that number, all of a sudden we have this export demand that we then compete against and might start to see, you know, maybe structurally higher prices um, domestically. So there's there's a bit of a push pull. So um, I think that finds its equilibrium. The tilt is towards the U.S. Um, expanding the export capacity, but we kind of have to think about this holistically, um, not just the eurozone, but also you know regionally, domestically, that type of thing. Yeah, on the ag side, we are doing some things, uh, I think policy on the fiscal policy side that are geared toward ramping up production so that we can help fill some gaps left by Russia and Ukraine. Um, I, same with David, I don't know that the, we can ever fully replace those two because they are such major exporters and producers. Um, but I, th I think the, the goal has been to try to fill the gap uh, somewhat left behind just to make sure that the people that need food have it. Um, and so, you know, what does that mean long term? Um, you know, it, it is interesting. I've written some on the, the wheat side, the impacts of the Russia grain embargo, what they had on, you know, the long term effects on, um, on the global market for wheat and corn, you know, for example, prior to the Russian grain embargo, the US was actually the world's largest exporter of wheat and corn. We used to account for about 50% of global wheat exports. Um, if you go back to about the 1960s and, you know, now we account for a much smaller share. Uh, it's, you know, around like 20% or so, um, which is still, significant, but nowhere near where we were. And so these types of you know, major shocks can have long term effects, um, but there are a lot of um, agricultural producers uh, in the world that can also help fill that gap as well. So I think that, you know, my response would be that the US is trying to position is always trying to position itself to be more competitive in global markets uh, for commodities. And that the the goal, at least from my perspective, would also be to help you know ensure food security in areas of the world that need it. And a couple of the policies that have been um, proposed have been to try to increase uh, our domestic crop production, and doing that by you know implementing more double cropping, which is where you can produce both wheat and you know say soybeans in the same year. It's actually very difficult to do. There aren't very many places in the US where you can do that because climate is a constraint. Um, but there are like in Missouri, for example, if there are any teachers on from Missouri, that's one of the you know, places where that's better suited both from a soil and, and climate perspective to do that. So um, there are some things that are occurring in the short term, but I would say long term, um, I think it is a goal in the US to be as competitive as we can be in global markets. Okay, and for our last question here, I'd like both of you to 
to address it with so much future, you know, um, uncertainty. Economically, what or, or how should we as consumers producers? Uh, we probably even have some entrepreneurs on the line. What can we do? Um, when it comes to, to looking forward and planning for our future. Yeah, that's a that's a humbling question. Um, I think, yeah, and this may sound, you know, silly, but I would just say, and if you know, for the educators on the line, one of the best pieces of advice that I've ever been given is just to read as much as possible. Um, you know, find you know reputable news sources, understand what is going on. I completely believe that knowledge is power. And that you don't have to be an economist to, you know, find information on what's going on in the world. Um, for example, I uh, read The Economist every week, uh, and uh, and the Wall Street Journal, and um, and so you know, name you know your reputable news source. I get a lot of really good articles from the Financial Times from David. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons he is is very knowledgeable about what's going on in energy because he's such a prolific reader. Um, so I mean I think that you know that sounds simple, but I think that you know in as difficult a, a time as this is, I think that the more knowledge that every person, every household, every business has um, to help develop very informed decisions, I think is is important. And I think that's why as policymakers. Not only do does the Federal Reserve hire a whole, a, a whole army of economists to track the data, but we're also very diligent about collecting anecdotes. You know, being you know in rooms with people who are active participants in the economy because we're gather, we're constantly gathering information um, from people who are you know living, working, doing business um, in the world, dealing with these shocks. Um, but I don't think that you have to work at the Federal Reserve to be able to do that. I think because I think that the information's out there um, uh, for those interested in and, and willing to read it. Yeah, and for me, it's that was, that's a very broad reaching question. So there's certain things that you control and certain things that you don't control, right? So if you got to eat every day and you've got to put gasoline in the car, those are things that you can't control. You can make minor adjustments on the margin, but it's challenging. Um, longer term, I think these types of shocks and this uncertainty actually creates a fair amount of opportunity because there's likely to be structural change. So if you're an educator and you're trying to point students towards opportunities that they might consider, when you sort of cast some of these things forward and you think about what's likely to shift over time, let's say, for instance, people are thinking about their supply chains again, and you are having to rebuild new manufacturing facilities because you want less exposure to less reliable suppliers. Maybe the skilled trades is a really good opportunity if those types of businesses are needing those folks within your region or your location. Um, if it's the energy sector and we're on an accelerated path towards renewable energy transitions, maybe there's some opportunities in the technology space or in the assisting of building out of that type of infrastructure. So it's massive uncertainty, but if you can sort of sift through the fog a little bit and maybe suss out a very loose, rough estimate of a direction, the, the runway or that path is actually somewhat wide. You don't have to be hyper precise to hit a positive mark Three years, five years down the road, when you think through these things logically over time, and I think to Courtney's point, oftentimes the local knowledge is actually more powerful than it is from our perspective looking at data. So, you know, folks living in regions, communities, towns, oftentimes might be better suited to make those decisions and make those assessments on what what positive outcomes are likely to take place from, you know, in this case, a catastrophe. Um, so that would be kind of how I would sort of frame it. All right. Well, thank you so much uh, to both of you, David and Courtney, for carving time into your schedules for all of us today. Um, it's been extremely valuable, you know, hearing from you and learning about some of the ins and outs, um, not only of this conflict, but you know how those other pieces have 
have impacted, you know, where we are today and, you know, what we can expect in the future. Um, we truly appreciate the, the wealth of knowledge uh, that you brought to us today and all of your work in this area um, as it, it impacts us in so many areas of our lives, as, as we've heard today, you know, both professionally and, and personally. So, thank you. Um, we'd also like to thank all of our teachers for attending today. We recognize that there are a lot of demands on your time. Um, and for many of you, it's your summer break. Uh, so we hope that the time that you spent with us today uh, has been worthwhile and it'll be useful to you and your students. Um, if you haven't already, there's still time to register for our next virtual workshop. It will be on June 30th, focused on inflation and what can be done to avoid another recession. Uh, and if you're in the Kansas City area, we'd love to have you join us in person on June 27th. Registration links will be added to the chat, um, so you can um, easily access them there. Uh, speaking of access, remember that the article that David and Courtney referred to throughout their presentation and the Q&A um, is also available through chat. And uh, for even more resources, educational resources, you can visit us um, on our website, kansascityfed.org slash education under the education tab, where you can access all of the resources that we've developed, searchable by topic, grade range, and more. And if you're looking to find educational materials that are produced throughout the Federal Reserve System, please visit federalreserveeducation.org, where you'll have direct access to hundreds of lesson plans, activities, videos, games, and more. And it's all free. So a survey is going to pop up as you leave today's session. Please take a few minutes to give us your feedback. Let us know how we can improve these programs for you in the future. We want to be able to benefit you and your students. We're here to help when it comes to teaching and learning about economics, personal finance, and career readiness. So feel free to reach out to any of us um, if you have questions or need help accessing any of our materials. On behalf of myself and the education outreach uh, team here out of the Kansas City Fed District, um, we thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much.